is Brian Childress. I'm an equipment engineering technician at Texas Instruments and I work in thin film. And I've been uh, in the industry for over 15 years. I'm also currently a student at UNT and working on my bachelor's degree. But uh, going through my course history, I feel that vacuum is one of those subjects they really don't address well enough. Uh, they touch on it in physics. They will discuss it in some of your science classes, but it just doesn't do it justice, in my opinion. And that's why we're here today. Vacuum. It doesn't suck. Now, what we're going to do is have a quick introduction into vacuum systems used in the semiconductor processing industry. And, uh, again, we're going to have a quick intro. We're going to have a definition and history, how it got its roots. Uh, we're going to start with a brainstorming exercise here in just a moment. Kind of get your thoughts on what you think of when I say vacuum. We're also going to discuss the hazards and precautions that are involved when you're dealing with vacuum systems. Then we'll get into them. The most common types of mechanical vacuum pumps, uh, they'll let you get rough vacuum, high vacuum, and ultimately ultra high vac, which I'll have to use a cryogenic cold trap to do. And then we'll kind of go over some of the lesser vacuum generators that are out there, and we'll finish up with a quick Q&A in case you guys have any questions. Alright, the dictionary defines vacuum as, one, the emptiness of space. And I'm just going to paraphrase that and say, why don't we just say outer space. And I think two ways kind of the same thing. A space absolutely devoid of matter. Again, outer space, I think that's saying the same thing. And what we're talking about today is 2B. And 2B says, a space partially exhausted, as to the highest degree possible, by artificial means, as an air pump. Well, instead of air pump, I'm going to say as a vacuum pump. And then it says down here a degree of rarefaction below atmospheric pressure. And I think that's saying anything at a lesser pressure than what you and I are currently breathing right now. So anything that's slightly vacuumed or below atmospheric pressure is considered a vacuum. So how did it get its roots? Well, this guy, Otto von Gerich, was the first one to give an example of the forces involved with vacuum. So in 1650, he attached two 14-inch copper bolts together with a metal gasket and used a simple hand pump and evacuated the pressure, or evacuated the atmosphere out of the two bowls. And if you look here, there's two teams of horses, eight on each side. And those two teams of horses could not separate those two bowls by a simple hand pump. That's how strong vacuum actually is. Uh, but he was the first one that was able to be kind of the godfather of vacuum. He was the first one to really demonstrate it and document it. Uh, the first time I saw it was at the Science Place Museum and here in Dallas. Uh, it had a feather and a penny, and it had two tubes. One was vacuumed out, and one was at atmosphere. And when he spun it upside down and stopped it, the one in vacuum, the penny and the feather fell at the exact same time. The one that had atmosphere in it, the feather floated and the penny dropped down. So you lose air resistance in a vacuum. Um, you also, apparently sound can't travel in a vacuum. So, uh, but light can. It's just some little quirkinesses of vacuum. So brainstorming activity. Let's name some types of vacuum generators. What can you think of? Anybody got any ideas when I say vacuum? What do you think of? I think of something that sucks. Like? Something that... Like a vacuum cleaner? Yes. Okay, vacuum cleaner is a, a really good example. It creates a lower, a lower vacuum a pressure reduction. Vacuum cleaner, that's a good example. What about automotive? Can you think of anything in an automotive industry that would uh, kind of be like a vacuum pump? Um, a car motor? Yep, some people put like blowers, blowers and turbos on a car. Great examples, let's say turbos, because turbos are turbos and maybe even a blower. All those, work, it depends on which side of the fan you're on or the generator you're on as to whether it's vacuum or it's pressure. So those actually you're trying to pressurize and move a lot of air into your engine. And what we're doing here is just the opposite in, in, in our industry. We're actually trying to evacuate all the air pull all the atmosphere out of our chambers. But those are good examples. So let's talk about the hazards and precautions. Number one, always, always, always wear gloves when you're dealing with vacuum. Uh, I've had 
this very type of glove on, touched a one inch diameter vacuum port, and it popped a hole. Luckily, it popped a hole in the glove, and it popped me like a rubber band. And luckily, that was the extent of my injuries because had I not had a glove on, I probably would have had the worst hickey in the world on my hand, and it would have looked a lot worse than that and probably been a lot more painful. Uh, we also have these gloves here are actually cryogenic gloves. We do have extremely low temperatures we will be dealing with with our cold traps, so you have to be thoughtful of that. It will stick your hand to them. And the biggest problem is the heavy, the, the, the heft of them. They're usually large, massive pieces of equipment. Use team lifts. We usually have lifting assisting. Uh, those are going to be your main things to watch out for is just the, the sheer weight of them. So, let's talk about vacuum. Let me show you the scale over here. So this is the atmosphere where you and I and everybody else are breathing at right now. And let's just say, way over here is the outer space, perfect vacuum. I don't think it really exists, even in outer space is not a perfect vacuum, but for our presentation, outer space, perfect vacuum, it's way over here. Here is zero. These pumps are called rough pumps. These are your primary, your main source of pumping, if not your sole source of pumping. Like sometimes a tool will share one pump for multiple chambers using different valves knowing they share them. Uh, but these are good to, for pumping from atmosphere where we're at right now and getting you down to zero. And if it's one of these larger machines, it might actually get you down into the Militor range. And Tor is the agreed upon scale. Kind of like Celsius, Kelvin, whatever. It's the actual scale that we use to verify with pressure. We're not using PSI. We could convert it, but we don't. So, again, these are rough vacs. These, if you can see here, they have different size intakes. There's usually an exhaust on the back. Based on the size of the intake or the exhaust, you can kind of judge on how much throughput these machines can make. Uh, like I said, they come in all sizes. The biggest problem with them is they are noisy. And in fact, they're usually housed on a separate level of the semiconductor fab, just due to the fact that you will have to use ear protection if you work more than 20 minutes around these things. So, but these are great for general purpose pumping, and again, they get you from atmosphere, they're your main pump, to get you down to zero, okay? So now let's talk about high back. So now let's say you want to go from zero down to somewhere around in this range, because you really need a good vacuum. You're going to have to use something like a turbo molecular pump, or a turbo for short. And they come in all sizes. This is probably a 4 inch. You can see my thumbs in the way there. So that's a small little 4 inch. And this is a large, I should have put my hand in here, but this is a 14 inch turbo. And I think there's actually two turbos on that particular chamber. So it's a twin turbo setup. So it depends on what you, you're doing as to how much and what size you can pick. It's usually predetermined, but we service them, we work on them. And the principle behind the turbo is it's a fancy fan. If you look at it, it's like a jet engine. You've got turbine blades that are spinning, multi-levels of them, and you got stators that are just static, they're not moving. And realistically, you're trying to create a vortex or a tornado effect inside there. And what that does is help you get down into this lower negative six range, into the Militor range, okay? So, one thing to note, you see this screen? There's a screen on here, it's hard to see, but that's to keep loose debris, loose materials from sucking into the, to the stators or the turbines while they're spinning. It will create a catastrophic collapse. It will actually, what we call salad bowl. It's not a good thing. It usually is detrimental to the equipment and can be detrimental to humans, so just be thoughtful of that. Uh, that's why we have to use a rough pump to get us down to here. And then we can open up the turbo. There's a gate valve that will open and expose it. You can't open these up to atmosphere, or you will. It will be such a disturbance to the blades that any kind of deviation in here. There's not a. There's these are tight tolerance. Any kind of deviation like that would actually shock it enough to shut it down. So be thoughtful of that. Do not open these up to atmosphere. They're made to be pumped to rough back. You expose it to this turbo, and then you can reach the high back. So it allows you to go from zero into the Militor range to get on down to the negative six range, which will get you into the micro tour range. Now, ultra high back. So to get to ultra high back, 
you're talking getting down here into the nanotour range, the negative nine skill. So you use a rough back to get you pumped down. There's a little door here that opens up that allows exposure to a cold array inside here. And a cold array is nothing more than charcoal glued to the back of a really cold helium array. Downstairs there's a helium compressor. It's compressing helium, shoots it up here to these lines. It comes in here. There is an actual piston inside here that is not a part of the actual chamber itself. It's not exposed. But it decompresses the helium, it freezes it, gets it down to a, I'm going to say 10 Kelvin, which is pretty cold. And again, there's no mechanical moving parts inside the chamber volume. Just like the turbo, you cannot open this up to atmosphere. When you open it up to atmosphere, you will get this right here. And I actually scratched ice in it because it ice balled. And with the ice balling, uh, the moisture in the air is actually frozen immediately to the array. It's just a bad idea. So what you have to do, just like the turbos, you have to pump it down from atmosphere, get into the military range, and then you can open up that gate valve. And what happens is, let's say you got water vapor inside your chamber, or a hydrogen molecule, or an oxygen molecule, whatever it is. On a microscopic level, if you were to look at it, the charcoal is cold. And when that water, vapor, whatever molecule is, goes inside the charcoal, it is so cold it actually gets trapped, thus cold trap. And once it's trapped, it's kind of locked in there and your pressure drops just to the fact that it is a cold magnet, more or less. It's just a magnet that holds it. And due to the fact that the charcoal is actually holding that gas or that molecule, it will actually get loaded over time and will need to be regenerated. And to do that, we shut the helium off, we heat up the array, we let all that charcoal out gas, all the stuff that got trapped in it, we thin it off. And uh, it's, a, it's a maintenance issue that has to be taken care of on the regular. So it is a maintenance requirement. Uh, one thing to take note of is please be careful of the gases that you put into it because when you do regen them, they will all be out gassed. And if you have volatile gases, let's say like oxygen, hydrogen, uh, any kind of pyrophoric, silane, any of these gases that are really toxic or harmful, you have to be cautious of that exhaust because it could become a bomb. So, and uh, again, the Kelvin, like I said, we got down to 10 Kelvin. So, everything we know, most of us know the Celsius scale. It's kind of based off water. At zero degrees, water freezes. At 100 degrees, water boils. Well, at negative 273 degrees is absolute zero actually 273, negative 273.15. They changed it and came up with the Kelvin scale. Uh, that, this guy based it off the coldest that we could achieve, and we just called it absolute zero. So it's based off absolute zero and goes up from there. So we're able to get down to like 10 Kelvin, which is 10 degrees above absolute zero, which in my opinion is very astonishing and impressive, and I just think it's awesome. So let's talk about some lesser common types of vacuum pumps. So Venturi pumps, it was named after the guy that kind of was able to define the action involved with a spray paint gun, an airbrush gun. You have compressed air coming in, shooting across an orifice. It will actually generate a small amount of vacuum and pull paint. In this case, it'll pull paint through with it as you blow across. So they're able to produce vacuum on uh, compressed air. So if you have a compressed air source, you can actually generate vacuum based on it. Diaphragm pumps, um, they're great for small volumes, but their one downfall is they have wear parts that actually will break down and deteriorate, need servicing. So they're good for certain applications. And then you have vein pumps. These were great general purpose pumps of the past, and they've been slowly replaced with our booster scroll pumps that we have nowadays for the rough pumps. But, uh, and I didn't put it on here, but there are some old wet pumps which had really toxic oils in them that were PCB laden, just hazardous, and sometimes if you had a hiccup in the system or a power sag, you could actually backstream that nasty oil all into your chamber. So they've gone to the wayside for more environmentally and human friendly purposes. So that pretty much concludes it. Do we have any questions? Answers? No? Um, you have, did you have a question to ask? No. Okay. Well, thank
thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate it.